What if I could convince you today with a revelation that gives you an unwavering confidence that there is no failure as a believer? Challenge accepted. Here's my text. Luke, the 22nd chapter, verse 31. And, ooh, I think we got it. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he would sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen the brethren. Look at your neighbor and say, you cannot fail. Now, that was too nice. That just didn't sound very convincing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You may be seated. What a joy to be here. I love Pastor Torre and First Lady Sarah. I, 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 I love them so much and have been serving them and uh, covering them in prayer as a, as a young apostle that, has been in the ministry for 50 years. I just absolutely would lay my life down for them. And it is always an honor to be here. It's, it's an incredible thrill. And you know, so many things have changed for them and us as God is expanding their sphere of influence. And I just want to encourage you to hold on to it. Hold on to what God is doing in their life. Hold on to the whole dynamic of what's happening to one church. Embrace it. Uh, Success is more of a responsibility than a reward. And that will be good for you to know that success that God wants to give you is going to mean more responsibility. And so as our pastors continue to reach out and influence in a greater capacity, keep tied in with that, with your time, talent, and treasure. Keep connected to that because that connection is going to trickle down to you. The Bible says that if you give a prophet a glass of water, you get the same reward. So God says, okay, you're doing your part. The prophet's doing their part. All of you are going to get connected and be rewarded by this. And so I, I need you to feel encouraged that even though maybe you don't always see and, you know, it, it feels different because of the expansion of the ministry, you're connected, the favor's there, and besides our bench, my Lord, the preachers that get on this pulpit and feed you every week are um, amazing. And, and honestly, I'm not, this is not false humility. I, I watch and I say, well, what do they need me for? Uh, but you know, everybody has an uncle like that and I'm an uncle and here I am. But I, I really... I really want you today to, to really to, to grab a hold of, of, of what God is saying as we come into this holy week in, in a pivotal time prophetically, that the Lord would say to you, I got you. I've, I've already figured this whole thing out. I, I've seen your life from the beginning to the end. I know everything about you. God lives in past, present, and future simultaneously. So he's already been, he's, he saw the end and the beginning, no surprises of your behavior or your circumstances have taken him by, whoa, didn't see that coming. And he wants me to tell you today, just like he told Simon, you cannot fail. And I know when I say those words that you're not going to hear them really for a few minutes. I, I recognize I got my work cut out because I, I'm fighting against voices in your head that have said you're a failure. Your marriage failed. You're, you, you went for a college degree. That failed. I, I, I know that these voices are there and the, the barrier and the subconscious defense is there. And, and, and like water on a duck's back, I can have felt, sure, <laughs> great title, <laughs> great, great. But I'm going to tell you by the Holy Spirit, I'm, there's going to be an anointing that's going to eclipse me. And it's going to pierce into the very dark, dark chambers of your mind that you allow the enemy to torment you and to intimidate you. And to cause you to withdraw and draw back. But I've come to tell you today. You.
cannot fail. You cannot fail. The text comes from the Last Supper, the famous Last Supper that we'll be remembering this Friday night, taking communion. Don't want to miss Friday night. It'd be an incredible time to honor. And this text takes place in what's called the Last Supper. Jesus tells them, there's a guy that's got a big room. Tell him the master has use for it. And that's so cool about God. God gave this man a big house with a big Passover room, a big room that can have a lot of people and, and then let him live in it. I believe God has nice cars, nice homes, nice prosperity out there, and all we have to do is say, it's yours whenever you want it. I'll take care of it until, right? And, and, and the night in this Passover is not like the movies we see. It's certainly like, not the, like the paintings we see. It's actually a night that if you were to slip into the room, First of all, you wouldn't see Jesus because Jesus is on his hands and knees. He's washing the feet of each one of the disciples, towel on shoulder, basin of water, washing their feet. And you would hear mumbling and, and you would hear boisterous boastings and belittling and bandering and bewilderment. And it would sound chaotic and confusing. And you would look around the room and you would see these men, clueless, not a clue that they're having a supper that we will all be reminiscing and reflecting on 2,000 years later. It wasn't really a pretty sight. If you compare all the gospels, you can hear the conversation. Who's the greatest among us? Well, I think I am. No, I am. Who will sit on Christ's hand in his kingdom on the right hand and the left? I think I will be doing that. They're arguing. They're debating. Silly men. Leave it there. The only person that feels serious in the room is Judas. He looks a little disconnected as he sits down for the third time underneath the table, he's counting 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 30 pieces of silver that he's holding underneath the table that he got underneath the table by the high priest who no doubt that same table was the one Jesus kicked and turned upside down. I'm just saying. You weren't there, but I got the mic. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Jesus stands up, takes a seat. I've been waiting for this night to have supper with you for a long time. I desire this, although this will be a night of suffering for me. They still don't know. They still don't get it. Jesus looks up in the heavens because he knows what's about to happen in a few hours. Meanwhile, Judas Iscariot, Judas <laughs> Iscariot, slithers his hands underneath the arms of John the Beloved with a bigger portion of bread than he really should have taken, he reaches for the cup to dip it in the wine. Jesus catches him in the corner of his eyes, sees what he's doing, and says, one of you will betray me this night. The disciples, is it I, is it I? Judas, is it I? Jesus now by that time has covered Judas' hands and with his bread, their bread kiss in the wine. It is you. And what you do, do quickly. He cowers back into his seat. 
slyly slithers down the hallway of the room, darts down the steps into the dark night and the crucifixion. And history is now in full motion. The disciples still clueless think Judas, who was the treasurer, carried all the money and went before always, still had no idea what was happening. Jesus said, many of you will suffer. You'll be ashamed. You'll, you'll struggle because of tonight. Simon Peter stands up. Oh, Lord, oh, not me. I will never deny you. Peter, <laughs> sit down. You'll deny me three times before the sun rises. But listen, Simon. Listen, all of you, listen to me. Satan wants to take you and sift you like wheat. He wants to grind you. He wants to break you down. He wants to violently shake you until anything good in you is broken at his will. Ah, but I have prayed for you. Do you understand that you're not doing this alone. Do you understand that according to Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 that God is able to save us to the utmost and that Jesus ever liveth to be an intercessor for you. Do you realize that when you went to bed last night that while you were sleeping, your intercessor was praying all night for you. He's praying for you. He's never ceased to pray for you. And when Jesus prays, God listens. His prayers cannot fail. Whoa, 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 just a second. Jesus, sorry. They didn't hear me. Hang on a second, because just wait, wait. When Jesus prays, <laughs> the Father hears him, and his prayers do not fail. Neither can you. Come on, give God praise. You know I'm trying to put something inside your spirit. Mm, can I fail? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You'll make mistakes. You'll have mishaps. You'll have regrets. You'll have disappointments. And you say, well, it's the same thing, is it? No, I, no, no, no. No, I beg to differ. Mistakes are mistakes, mishaps, disappointments, regrets. That's one thing. Failure is a condition that the devil loves to use to label us. He loves to make the event your identity until he can get you to make fail yours. Oh, that's good. I was, was going to say, I can say that better. No, I can't say that better. That's, uh, yeah. Because if he can get you, you're a failure. You're a loser. You learn failure at, as a kid in sports. You lose a game. You, your team loses. You, you learn failure at school when you don't get the grade that you wish you had. You learn failures when you have relationships that go sideways. You have failures when you started a business and it went bankrupt. You have failures in relationships and, and after a while it just gets past the skin, gets inside you, it becomes who you are. You walk through life trying to act cool, be good, but down deep inside you hear the chanting of that failure saying to you, you will never arrive, you'll never reach your dreams, you'll never, you are a failure. No, so mistakes and mishaps and, and, and regrets and disappointment, that's one thing, but if failure ever penetrates and gets to your heart, he's got you, when he labels you, he can marginalize you, he can, he can mark you, he can, 
paint you. He can tilt you away from the true you. He can shade you. He can change you. I'm on a roll right now. Come on. He can, he can put the shame on you, the blame on you, tame your dreams and lame your ambitions. Ooh, yeah, that's good. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I want you to laugh a little bit because I'm digging deep right in here. I'm going right in here and telling you. You cannot fail. You cannot fail. You get that in your spirit? You recognize that you, you don't take the bait. You know, we're, we're in Hollywood. You guys know how it all works. We all go, we see these people winning the Oscars, and, which some of you are going to win in the future here. And, and uh, you see all these movies. And, but you, you, you know how it works. Uh, years ago, my wife and I went to see uh, Jerry Maguire, and we were in the theater, and one part where Tom looks at Renee and says, you complete me. And my wife, she's squeezing my hand like, oh, it's a moment. And I could see she's got like a tear in her eye. I had something in my eye, I didn't know what it was, it was a, a splinter or something. And she squeezes that hand like, he's so romantic. And then, and then I kind of got cynical up there for a second. I thought, well, hang on just a second. That ain't him. He didn't write that. Someone gave him that line. I don't have nobody doing that for me. I could be romantic too if I had script writers. That Say this right now. And, and, and I can tell you also, I wasn't there, but I got a feeling it wasn't the first take. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Action! You complete me! Cut! No, Tom. <sighs> Slow it down. Look her in the eye. Action! You complete me? <laughs> no, Tom. Cut! Light! Action! You! What's my line? By the time they got it all put together, the wife is crying and saying, what a, no, can I tell you that God, your heavenly Father, is the producer. The Holy Spirit is the director. And Jesus is the Oscar-winning editor. <laughs> Cut, slice, And at the end, the Oscar goes to. <laughs> what am I trying to say to you? I'm trying to tell you that because Jesus is your intercessor and because of what happened later that night and that when Jesus took the bread in the cup and he said, remember this night. I'm trying to tell you what happened that night and why we will take communion Friday night and why we do fast or we do try to change the routine of life because you want to remember what happened on Friday long ago, long before they called it good. Because when Jesus went to that cross and they nailed him to that cross and they beat him to his bones, the picture of of the real Calvary would make the passion of the Christ look like a Disney film. And in fact, it was such an excruciating sight, that's where the word crucifixion comes from, crucifixion, that artists dare not even render a picture of Calvary till three or 400 years later. No one would dare touch it, it was too gross, it was too, it, it, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't even imagine what it looked like for Christ to be on that cross and then put a picture and let people look at it. Long before we put it around our neck and put diamonds on it, it was a sight that you have to look at and every once in a while, remember. Why? Why is it important? Because it's the key to what I'm saying. When I say, you cannot fail because when Christ went to the cross, here's what happened. You see, since Adam and Eve Satan had the upper hand on man because it worked like this. One man's sin tainted all of mankind. See, now we know it by science. 
See, back then we just had to assume, oh, Adam sinned, and I guess we're all sinners now. But we all know now that the DNA gets transferred from one generation to the next. That in every deed there is a seed, and every seed there is a deed, and on and on, until iniquity just keeps piling up on the human race. And when we live in a culture that we have everything going for us, we are imploding on ourselves. That's because of sin. And that sin has been leveraged by the enemy to make us failures. To label ourselves as failures. And religion loves to make you feel like a failure because it can manipulate you and intimidate you and control you. The last thing religion wants you to know is what Jesus did on that cross and how God views you now that he has accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because it will set you free. And the Bible says that Jesus on that cross became sin. This is so vital, so simple, but so important. He became sin. He who knew no sin The devil had already tried him and couldn't get him to break the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Couldn't break him. Sinless, he stood. Satan said, if I can't tempt him, if I can't make him sin, I'll kill him. Had he known what he was doing, he wouldn't have crucified. That's what the Bible says. Watch very carefully. I I, I wish I could find words to, to communicate this statement. But he who knew no sin, positionally, and this is important, positionally, stepped into sin, became sin, never did it, never committed it, but in that moment on the cross, he became sin. So much so that Isaiah said he was smitten of God. Turned his back on the grotesque, bloody mess of sin hanging on a cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that moment was the most triumphant moment of humankind. Because at that moment, God allowed Jesus to become sin. And in that moment, the sin offering for humanity was in fact hanging on the cross. It was in that act that Satan did not realize he had played into God's hand because now the left foot dropped. He had dropped in the garden, the right foot, and now the left foot. Because of one man's sin, all have been jaded. All have been tainted. Ah, but because of one man's righteousness. All in him become righteous. Not by behavior. Because our righteousness is as filthy rags. It's not by anything we've done. It's not based on our belief, on our behavior. It's based on our belief. If you can believe what I just said, then you stand before Almighty God, righteous. All he can see when he sees you is him. Look at what the scripture says. Uh, Paul writes this to Romans, and let me just, this is the message translation, but he says it, and I want to go through it because I want you to know I'm not making this up. I'm I'm not just, you you know the story of how Adam landed in the dilemma where in first sin, then death, and no one was exempt from either sin or death. That sin disturbed relationships with God and everything and everyone. But Adam, who got us into this, also points ahead to the one who will get us out of this. If one man's sin put crowds of people at dead end abyss of separation from God, just think what God's gift poured through one man, Jesus Christ, will do. Woo! 
You can get happy. Here, 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 here. This is the Bible I'm reading, the message translation. Here it is in the nutshell. Just as one person did wrong and it got us all in this trouble with sin and death, another person did it right and got us out of it. More than just getting out of it and out of trouble, he got us into life. Somebody give God a praise. That's why we call it Good Friday. Somebody shout Good Friday. Good God Friday. Come on, somebody get happy with me right now. I just want to, I just, I, I just want to. <laughs> and if you own this, if you get this, if you embrace this, then you will be able to say deep in your heart, never be taken away from you. I cannot fail. Now, let me give you a quick little Bible study that I think is real simple, but it's really sophisticated theologically. I told you I've been going to church for 68 years. I'm not, uh, I'm not brag humbling here. I'm just trying to make a point here. So I've been here and preaching all of my life. I've been preaching for 50 years, studying the Bible for 50 years. And I, I have compiled and accumulated years of study about the judgment of God. Brother, I heard a lot about the judgment growing up. I mean, I, I was in one of those churches, hell, fire, and brimstone. Every Sunday. And I have come to understand, and this will pass the test of any theologian or scholar. So when I give it to you, this will change your life forever. If you grasp this, if I get you to come back, some of you are already into tomorrow. If I can get you to get right here in this moment, and you can memorize this and own this, and then assimilate it in your mind until it becomes a part of your action, it'll change your life forever. There are three types of judgments in the Bible. Three types of judgment that every human being must face. They are, number one, the judgment of sinners. Every person is going to face judgment for, the, for their sins. And this is not just what you did, but it's who you are. Because you were born and shaped in iniquity. There is none righteous, no, not one. Secondly, there's the judgment of sons or daughters or children of God. In other words, once you become a child of God, God works on you. He, 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 he uh, chisels away at you. He helps you become the true you that's who you're really supposed to be. And that's a judgment. And then there's the judgment as servants. That's what you'll face God for when you die. When you die as a believer, you won't face God for your sins. There's not a book up in heaven that's going to be telling you the 217, 100, 217 hundred thousand million billion <laughs> sins that you committed because they're gone. They're over there. There's a sea over there called the Sea of Forgetfulness. You will never, as a believer, never face God for your sins as a believer. They have been held accountable through Jesus Christ. The blood sacrifice, the sacrifice on the cross. That sin, judgment for a believer is past. Now, go to the scriptures and let me show it to you so you can see what I'm saying. All right? John 5, 24, most sincerely I say to you, he who hears my word and believe in him, he who sent me has everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but have passed from death unto life. So as a believer, you've stepped out of the judgment of all your behavior, past, present, and future. And you've stepped in a position totally by faith, totally by belief, that you are, not deservingly, but because of him, you are now standing in a posture that between you and God, you are now the righteousness of Christ. Don't get out of there. You're going to be tempted to step away from that. You're going to be tempted because you think you can actually be good enough to make God happy and you'll slip over there and say I got this thing down and then boom you're going to be tempted to say I can't not me uh, it, I can't do this no you have to stand in that position and say I am the righteousness of God my sins have been forgiven I have passed from the judgment of sin and death unto life everlasting. Give God praise for that. Let that get in your spirit. Yeah. Number two, servants. Our sons, I'm sorry, sons. Let's go to the scripture there. Hebrews 12, 6 says this, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. 
If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not chasten? For indeed, for a few days, chastening us as seems best to them, but for he, for our prophet, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, this judgment of sons and daughters and children of God happens every day, and it's us dealing with the consequences of our sin. The condemnation is erased. God is not condemning you, but if I punch you in the face and and then remind myself that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. But I might just get a punch back. And that's the truth. What I'm saying is, as sons and daughters, we will have to deal with the consequences of our behavior. Horizontally. But never vertically. Your sins being forgiven are non-negotiable. You don't renegotiate your covenant with God every time you sin. Because if you did, church dismissed. (laughs) Shut the church down. Let's hit the bars. It's over. Come on, go with me. I'm just having fun with you. No. 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 People say, well, it doesn't say if you confess your sins, God will be just and forgive you. Let's get that, let's get that context right. I'm going to throw a little theology at you here. Just get the con- First of all, there's no way you could possibly confess your sins. You can't remember them. You can't even remember what you did yesterday that was wrong. And that's just the sin of commission. Then there's the sin of omission. He that knoweth to do good and do it not, it's a sin. Oh, you, all day long. Oh, God, forgive me for that. Forgive me for that. Forgive me for that. Oh, God, forgive me. And forgive, and forgive me. No, no. If you confess, what's the word confess means? Agree with. Say the same thing as God says about your sins. Then as you walk in the light, as he is the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He's interceding for me. His sacrifice is still continually through the eternal spirit being offered unto God. Are you hearing me today? I need somebody to recognize I have broken free from the judgment of sin, but um, the judgment of sons. And this is where we get, this is where I get so messed up. And so many Christians, because when God chastens us, instructs us, makes us pay the consequences for our behavior so that we won't do it again, so that we can learn from it. If we're not careful, we think that's God condemning us and we lose our salvation and we lose our status. Are you, are you understand what I'm saying? And that's what, I, when I was growing up, every time I sinned and every time I got corrected by the word of God, reproved and, and instructed, I had to go all the way back. Oh God, I'm such a failure. I'll never do this again. Right. Start all over again. No, 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 no. I got to hold my place. I am the righteousness of God. That was really stupid of me what I did. Whew, man. I gotta learn from that. I can't be doing that. I am the righteousness of God. See, this is where you have the power to overcome it. Otherwise, you're just gonna be a repeat offender. (laughs) See, yeah, so you, you say, you know, I did something wrong. Horizontally, I gotta pay the price. I offended my wife. I violated our covenant. I did something wrong. God sees me as righteous. She don't. And I got to redo and rebuild my trust. But the only way I'll survive the consequences of my stupid behavior is to keep coming back to this place right here. I am the righteousness of God. I am not an adulterer. I am not evil. That is not who I am. I will deal with this from a position that I am the righteousness of God and I cannot fail. I cannot fail. Somebody say it with me. I cannot. One more time. I cannot fail. And so when Pastor Stephanie, when our team, when they're teaching you, take it. When somebody's instructing you, take it. When somebody's telling you, get your act together, take it. But don't lose your position. And then the last one is I close with servants. And when you die, you'll face God. 
And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Not in fear that you'll go to hell. Not in fear that the Father doesn't love you. But in fear that you have wasted your dreams. Wasted your talent. Wasted what could have been because you were afraid. And by the way, this message came from Pastor Stephanie when I watched her preach. So I'm giving you credit, Pastor Stephanie. And, 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 and if it turns out that nobody likes it, just deny it, deny it, deny it. You see? And this is why, and this is, this is my message to you. When you face God, he's not gonna be judging your sins and he's not gonna be judging you for all those lessons you had to learn over and over again. He's gonna say, well, done, or well, done. And the only thing that makes it across into eternity are the dreams you went after, the risk you were willing to take, the big bodacious ideas that you thought, I'm going for it, I'm swinging for the fences. And even if they don't make it, it's all right. That doesn't even get brought up. The Bible says of Roman, of, uh, in Romans of Abraham, the Bible says of Abraham, all of the heroes of faith in, the, in, in Hebrews chapter 11, but specifically of Abraham, it said, Abraham's faith never wavered. And that's not true. He had a baby by another woman besides his wife. He lied about who his wife was so that the king wouldn't kill him. By the way, everybody talked about how old uh, Sarah was. Oh, she was pretty enough for a king to want her. So talk to me. That's called wavering in my book, but guess what? Abraham was preached to in the grave, and he embraced the cross too. And so he stepped in to that place of righteousness. And then when he faced God and the judgment for his life was made, he's a man that never wavered. That's what God's going to say to you. But what he is going to say is what you do. Huh? Wake up. Dream again. Try again. You're not too old. You're not too uneducated. You're not too anything. You're, you're a child of God. Go for that audition. Doesn't matter. They turned down 99 times. So right, you just need one. Go ahead and ask that girl that you've been watching in church and, <laughs> and, and, and thinking, man, I ain't got my life together yet, man, before I ask her. <laughs> you know what? She may be the one to help you get out of that mess. I tell you, I, next week I will have celebrated 46 years of marriage. Jeannie saved my life. Had I not married her at 21, I'd be probably, I don't even want to say what I'd be doing because you might be doing that right now, but I'm just saying, she saved my life, man. Two is better than one. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, Jesus. You can not fail. Zig Ziglar used to tell a story. He called it the flea trainer. You put tr fleas in a jar. You put a lid on it, and then fleas try to get out. Boom, 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 Trained him. Lid off. Doesn't matter. Ain't never coming out. I'm talking to people that hit the lid one too many times. And now you've been trained by the enemy. Be afraid. Be very afraid. And this preacher has come to tell you, do not be afraid. The Lord is with you. You can not fail. You can not. I dare you to say, I cannot, I cannot fail. fail. Yeah, you can make mistakes, but cut, edit, action. Turn those mistakes into retakes. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. You're a mess, you're a mess, you're a mess. I know you're a mess, you're a mess. But let that mess get aged and make it your message. And then become the sage of your message. Oh, and those regrets, God turns them into regrets. So you know what? Take it in. In Jesus' name, let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for these precious people. I know that there's many different people walking different paths to you, in you, for you. Some of them are in very innocent stages of their life, and, and the dreams are still hovering over their heart. Others, they've been damaged. They've been hurt. They got a story, and that story is suck the life out of them and they're just they're just bouncing up but they're letting an imaginary lid lock them down and lock them in and lock them out they feel their damaged goods who wants me who would want me why should I even deserve to have another dream to have another shot I'm talking to some people here today you've had some success and now you're comfortable in it and you're, you're too afraid to do anything else now because you don't want to risk what you've got going for you. Don't be afraid. Watch me for a second. This is a prophetic word for somebody. Let me just look at me and let me just say this to you. The prophet Elisha died. They buried him in a cave. Years later, a soldier was killed and they had to quickly bury him. And when his bones touched the bones of the prophet, he came alive. And all my life I've heard preachers talk about even a prophet's dead bones will make a miracle happen until one day it dawned on me, no, 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 no. That really is a tragic story because that prophet died with a miracle in him. He still had something in him and he went to the grave with it. That shall not be you in Jesus' name. If you were to face God, are you at peace with God? Have you passed from sin, from death into life? Have you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? You can have confidence today. God is not against you. He is for you. And God has already forgiven you of your sins. All you need to do is accept it and receive it. And that comes through Jesus Christ, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or maybe you are a Christian, but you've drifted from your gift. You've drifted from your confidence. You've drifted from your faith and compromised and improvised and improvised and you're compromised. You know it. And you're like, God, how did I get here? You need a fresh new start. <laughs> you, you just need to press the reset button and say, let's, let's go, God. Uh, let's go. I'm going to use everything I've done as a reset, and I'm going to strengthen the brethren. But it's my time now to get back on track, if that's you. If you want to make peace with God and be born again, or if you are a Christian, but you want a fresh new start, with boldness and confidence, I want you to raise your hands and don't be ashamed. I'm ready. I'm ready. Just raise it. Raise your hand. Keep it up. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Come on. Give God praise. Don't be ashamed. God said, you're ashamed of me. I'll be ashamed of you for my father. I'm not ashamed, man. I need a new start. I need to be born again. I need what this preacher's preaching. Beautiful, beautiful. All of us, let's use our hands as our heart and lift them up and let's pray this prayer together with them. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. You died on the cross for my sins. I repent of my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Raise me up to a new life. I accept being born again by faith. And Lord, from this day forward, I'm going to give my all to you. No condemnation. Not afraid to to be corrected and I'm going to live a life in such a way that when I come to that final judgment my heavenly father will be pleased 
I cannot fail. Give God praise, everybody. I sure love you. I love you.